Hey, it's Hawken with Top Don. Today we're going to do a video on cloning a CAS module. Now, if you're not familiar with the CAS module, on BMW this is typically the primary immobilizer module. So in many cases, uh, if you need to replace this module, you either A, need a brand new unit, or B, you will need to perform a cloning operation in order to make a used unit work with the vehicle. So in this particular video, we're going to walk you through step by step how this is carried out. So the tools we're going to use for today, uh, I'll move my little bubble here for you so you can see. The tools we're going to use today are the Top Don T-Ninja Box and the Top Don Phoenix Max. So these two tools uh, can be used for a lot of cloning operations. You can also use many of the other Top Don Professional Series Scan tools in conjunction with the T-Ninja Box. Uh, this would include the Phoenix Smart, the Phoenix Elite, uh, the Phoenix remote. Basically, it has to have a USB connection from the dongle to the tool in order for it to be able to be used for the cloning functions. Now we're going to move my bubble back here so you can see things well. Okay, so just wanted to give a special thanks to the folks that cooperated in helping make this video possible. Uh, Richborg Certified uh, Car Care and uh, Nick, who is a technician there. Uh, they're in St. Augustine, Florida. So just wanted to say thank you. They uh, participated in helping make this video possible and uh, allowed us to uh, make this content for you. So big thanks to them. So let's get started. Uh, our project today is, again, we're going to clone the CAS module, which is the primary immobilizer module on this BMW. This is, as you saw on our first slide there, a 2013 BMW E70 LCI. Uh, E70 LCI is the chassis code or specific designation of the platform that we are working on. The module was diagnosed as intermittently failing, and so the shop said, hey, we need to make a replacement here in order to make the vehicle reliably start and run. Uh, if you have a defective CAS, the vehicle may start and run intermittently as a result of the security authentication not properly taking place. So the new CAS, or excuse me, the original CAS does still communicate. So if the original CAS does not communicate anymore, you may not be able to clone that module. A used module has been sourced that has the same part number as the original, and of course we need those numbers to match in order to ensure that the cloning will be successful and it will work in the vehicle. When we're cloning a given CAS module, the details may vary depending on the specific model of CAS. So this video pertains specifically to a very narrow subset of CAS units. It is a CAS 3 generation, and there is a designation that is printed on the MCU chip on the, inside the CAS itself, and that designation is 0L15Y. So this video only pertains to this particular chip. Now, the process may be similar on other CAS units, but I just want it to be clear that this video pertains specifically to this unit. There may be additional steps required if we do a different CAS. So let's go ahead and get into the cloning. So the first thing we're going to do when we're going to connect to this module, we're going to go into the scan menu, not auto scan. We're going to select BMW. Pretty straightforward, right? It's a BMW we're working on. We're going to hit OK, which is in the bottom right where my bubble is. Make sure your software is fully updated before you perform this function. Then we're going to select the anti-theft system once we get into the BMW menu structure. Then we're going to hit OK after we have connected our T-Ninja box and the dongle of our scan tool with the Y cable provided with the T-Ninja box. We're going to plug in the power supply cable that comes with the T-Ninja box to this cable as well. And then we're going to connect the USB cable from the dongle to the scan tool. Once we've done this, we're ready to proceed into the software further. You'll get a menu like this. Your, men your menu will show you various module replacements 
depending on which module you need to replace, you're going to choose the appropriate menu. In this case, we're replacing the CAS, which again is the primary immobilizer module on this vehicle. So we're going to go through the immobilizer module replacement menu. Now, you're asking yourself, well, how do we know which CAS we have in this vehicle? We can use a very helpful website, which is a subscription website, but highly useful if you're working on these cars with any frequency. Any European cars, period, you will find this website to be very helpful. So we're going to go into partslink24.com. We're going to stick our VIN in there, and the VIN is going to filter all of the information on the vehicle from a parts perspective so that then we can go in and look at the CAS listing inside the parts breakdown. And you see here is E70 over on the top left. And then we have in the center here, it shows us the CAS 3 is the generation we're specifically dealing with here. And we have the part number. So if we need to match up specific donor part numbers, or maybe the part has been superseded, PartsLink24 will have your most updated part number. So if you're trying to source a used unit, you can use the part number that's on the original module, or if there is a part number listed in the catalog that is a later revision, you will be able to see that in PartsLink24 as well, which of course can be useful for sourcing a donor. You figured out what specific unit we're cloning, which again is CAS3 in this situation. We are going to select that generation. So we're going to click on CAS3. The next menu we're going to have is for various MCU chips. So the MCU a little square uh, chip on the board and there will be an etching or writing on that chip that provides the specific subtype. This subtype is what you need to find so that you can select the appropriate menu for the CAS you're working with. So in our case we found the etching on the CAS MCU and on the MCU it showed 0L15Y which means that's what we're going to select specifically in the menu. Now, it's also important to remember that many of these cloning functions may require a soldering iron and some very, very good skill with the soldering iron. You may wreck a module if you are not careful and you do not have the appropriate skills to perform the soldering. So just keep that in mind. You're going to need to have that skill set before you get into this. So the first thing we're going to do after we've selected the appropriate unit is we have to look at the connection diagram so we know what we have to do in order to get this module to talk. Whoops, went too far, sorry. So you're going to get a diagram that's going to show you the board. So it's going to circle the MCU, which you see here. And then it's going to tell you what connections have to be made. Now the resolution of this picture on my video is not necessarily as good as what you'll see on the tool. But you can see the tool shows you the exact connections you have to make and which cable and hardware you have to use. So you have to use the MCU V1 or MCU 1 V2 as an adapter plate. Then we have to solder specific connections to the board in order for the connection to work. So again, like I said, we have to have a specific skill set here in order to be able to perform this cloning. So here's a picture. Uh, our technician, Nick, has soldered the proper connections using the diagram. And of course, he's also got a magnifying glass or a digital magnifying glass here to help him with the soldering. So he the small connections that have to be made appropriately. And he's going to go ahead and make those connections to the board. Here's just a general picture once he's got everything soldered and he has the MCU adapter plate installed. You can see he's got the USB cable here connected from the dongle to the tool and also the Y cable from the T-Ninja box to the dongle. Once we've made the appropriate soldering connections, we're going to read the chip ID. This is the initial step in validating if we have an affirmative connection with the module. So we get a module chip ID, which means we do have an affirmative connection, which means we should be able to read the data. So the first thing we're going to do is back up the EEPROM data. Now, currently, we are connected to the original CAS from the vehicle that has a problem. Again, connecting to the original CAS first so we can harvest the data from that module. So we're going to connect. All the soldering has been done. We're going to back up the EEPROM data, and we're going to do this at least twice. 
you're going to get a message like this that shows that it's making the connection to the chip. Then it's going to tell you if it connects successfully, it's going to ask you to save the file. When we name the file, I typically name the file something like original CAS and maybe the last six or seven of the VIN. Something of that nature. Something you can use to differentiate what file is what. Something that's very clear. You could use the date. You could use the VIN, whatever it is that you want to use, so long as you remember. The other key you want to remember is, I would also place a suffix like V1, version 1, or V2, version 2, if you have to, or when you make multiple reads of the data, you want to make sure that as you make those multiple reads, you name them different versions. That way, when we go compare the data to make sure there's data consistency, we know that we have multiple unique versions or hopefully not unique, right? We want them to be identical, but naming them version one, two, three is a good practice. So you can see here, I'm just calling it the OG CAS and the date. We know which day we're doing this operation. And once we've named it, it's going to tell you it saved it correctly in the file structure. Pay attention to where it saves it. You're going to repeat that process again at least twice on the EEPROM data. Now we can go and back up the flash data. So now we're going to read that flash data again at least twice. If you have a CAS unit that may be having issues, you may have to read it more than a handful of times. In this particular situation, we had to read it six times before we got two files that were consistent with each other. And that can happen if you have a CAS unit that is starting to fail. So just be aware of this. Once we've read the flash data, it's going to ask you to save it again. And you see I'm going to name it flash data. And we're going to put a version 1, version 2, v1, v2 suffix on the end so we can differentiate between each of our files. Once we've saved the flash data and the EEPROM data at least twice, and there's our anti-theft data saved, right, the flash data. We're going to go to the exit button, the little door in the top right corner here, and we're going to go all the way back out to the main menu. So now we're back on the main menu, and again, doesn't matter which tool we're using here in the Pro Series, they're all going to have a services menu. We're going to click on the services menu, then we're going to go to IMMO Prog. Once we reach IMMO Prog, It'll give you a little warning indicator saying, hey, make sure you actually own the hardware. Make sure your software for IMMO Prog is updated, of course. And then we're going to enter in. Again, we have to have the T-Ninja box and the dongle connected together with the Y cable, with the power supply plugged into the Y cable, and the USB cable plugged from the dongle to the tool. You may get a firmware update on your T-Ninja box when you go into this menu. So make sure you go ahead and perform that. Ours is upgraded, successful. Now, once we're into the menu for the IMMO prog, we need to run the data comparison tool. The function of this is to verify that the files that we read from the original CAS module are consistent. If they are not consistent, this may mean that we had issues with our connection. Uh, the module could be failing internally. There are a number of possibilities, but we want to keep this in mind. We need to make this data comparison to make sure that that data that we read is not corrupted. If we do not do this, we could write corrupt data to the donor CAS, which in turn would result in a crank no start. Maybe not even a crank, but no matter what, we're going to be in worse shape. So now, once we're into the data comparison tool, You'll see an F1 and an F2 button. Click on one of them first. Load the original file, version 1, version 2, version 3. Then click on F2 and load the second version you want to compare it to. So if we have EEPROM data version 1 and EEPROM data version 2 from the original CAS, we're going to load those side by side, and then we're going to use our comparison button. So I'll move my little bubble just so you can see it here. So there's our comparison button in the top or bottom right, excuse me. So let's go to the next slide. So here you can see we've got two versions of the flash file loaded, one in each slot. 
and we're going to do this with both the EEPROM data and with the flash files. And we need to make the comparison button. You can see here we have file data consistency. If it says that the contents are the same, that means that there's consistency in the data, which means the data you read twice or three times or however many times you compare the files is consistent. This is what we want to see. If, however, you get this message, then you have a problem with the data you read. If that occurs, you're going to want to go back and reread the related files. So if you get two versions of EEPROM data you make a comparison on and they are not the same, then you need to go back and reread the EEPROM data several more times and compare each of those files until you get two that are identical. Then you need to make a notation of which two are identical. And those are the files that you would want to use for writing to the donor CAS. This is very important. The same goes for the flash data. If the flash data you compare, version 1, version 2, version 3, if there is not file consistency, as we see here, there's an error, we need to go back and reread it until we get at least two versions that are identical. Why? Again, this is because we would be writing corrupted data to the donor CAS if we do not have at least two reads that are identical. So now we have two reads of our EEPROM data and our flash data that are identical using the file data comparator menu in the IMMO prog section of the services menu. Now, since we have two files that are consistent of EEPROM and two files that are consistent of flash, we can take ourselves back out to the menu. We can disconnect the soldering connections from the original CAS module, and we can now solder to the donor CAS module using the exact same wiring diagram we started with. Now we're going to go back into the scan menu, just like we did originally for pulling the data out of the original CAS. We're going to go back to BMW, just like we did before. We're going to hit OK. We're going to go into the anti-theft menu, just like we did before. We're going to make sure our T-Ninja box is connected using the Y cable, the USB cable from the dongle to the tool, and the power supply cable plugged into the Y cable. Now we're going to go back into the immobilizer module replacement menu. We're going to select the cast generation, the same generation we selected before. We're going to select the exact same MCU chip designation as we did before, 0L15Y in this case. We're going to read the chip ID to confirm we have a positive and affirmative connection. We do. That's great. We've confirmed we have a good connection. We've proven that we can read the chip ID. We know our soldered connections are good. Now we can go ahead and restore the data to the donor CAS module. Again, now we're connected to the donor CAS module, not the original. We're going to restore the EEPROM data first. So we're going to pick the file. Remember, we have to make sure we pick the file that we verified was consistent. So if we read the EEPROM data twice and they were identical, doesn't matter which one of the two you pick. But we got to make sure we picked one of the versions that has an identical mate. Then we're going to write that to the CAS. We're going to get a message like this if everything was performed correctly, restored EEPROM data successfully. Then we're going to go back to this menu. And now we can restore the flash data to the donor CAS. Remember, again, we want to choose one of the flash files that has an identical twin, right? Because those two are the good reads of data. Then, when it goes to do the connection, you're going to notice that writing the flash data takes significantly longer than the EEPROM data. Don't disrupt this process. Make sure that the tool is sitting on a bench that nobody can mess with or interrupt, and let it do its thing until it's complete. Once we're all done writing the flash data, you'll see that we've restored the flash data successfully. Now we can go back, exit out of all of the menus. We can go all the way back to the main menu. 
And the next thing we're going to do is go install that donor CAS into the vehicle because we've written the EEPROM and the flash data to the CAS, so it now has all the same information inside it that the original CAS had. We can make all our desoldered connections, put the module back together, install it in the vehicle. Then we're going to reconnect the vehicle battery. Of course, that should be disconnected when we're removing modules. After we've reconnected, we're going to clear all the fault codes, verify the car starts and runs, then we're going to shut the car back off. We're going to start the car back up and rescan it once more and verify there are no immobilizer related fault codes or anti theft or anything of that nature. And of course, that the vehicle starts and runs. So here's our post scan. Here's our post scan on the vehicle. You can see here that after we started it back up and ran it, we don't have any fault codes in anything related to anti theft whatsoever. Everything in the vehicle is very, very happy, right? I'll move my little bubble here so you can see the rest of the scan. So you can see we don't have any faults in any related modules. The CAS has no faults. Footwell module, no faults. Uh, ECM had no faults. TCM had no faults. So all of the modules that are involved in the immobilizer function chain are fault free. The vehicle starts and runs perfectly. This is confirmation that our cloning was successful. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to watch our video showing you how to perform the cloning of this CAS3 module on this E70 BMW LCI platform. Again, remember, our video is specifically pertaining only to this exact CAS. The steps required on other CAS modules may be different. As always,